so before we start this event, man, can I have a one sweet song while I uh, open the floor for the Reverend Shelley's uh, to come and talk and for us with a break? <laughs>
is here. I saw Umbra Owen Zajake outside. Who else is here? You know, these are the elder actors who paved the way for me. You know, there are many also who are still alive who have done their things. Darlington Michaels, you know, Abandon Zumkulmun Zumkumbula is Papa G. You know, there's Raslilo, my lady. I never got to see him uh, perform maybe in his youthful days. I only saw him perform when he came back from exile. Uh, I think he did the um, Blame Me on History, which was a, a, a group by Blue Mugisan, which was adapted by the late Walter Chakela. You know, and I later had the opportunity of working with Yena Braslayo and the late Rasem Williams on this stage, and we were doing The Good Woman of Sharpville. You know, I was recounting the memory and uh, an incident that happened when we were doing The Good Woman of Sharpville. Rasem one time came and, you know, he had had a few. He had had a few. <laughs> it was uh, yeah, that. And, uh, and because I was one of the assistant directors of the play, I was given the duty to go and tell him only he cannot perform. And then he told how you go and tell him to die. Oh, child, man, I was a performer because we took shot, shot. Hey. I got that all the courage and I went and I came with the same one day, you know. Hey man, uh, it looks like, you know, we won't be able to perform today. <laughs> and he said, why? <laughs> <laughs> why I'm not performing? <laughs> How do you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, at school they taught us euphemism. Isn't it? Yeah, and I had to come up with some euphemism. And I said, no, I said, because, uh, you know, I think you are just a little unsteady. And he said, I see. Now uh, you must go and tell the whole world that some Williams could not perform. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but those are those are those are my memories. And like I say, we are riding on the shoulders of giants. And um, I would like to read a poem in tribute to. Science. Some would define poetry as heightened emotion recollected in tranquility. And this poem for me captures Brasen Amindra Brasayas for me. It is titled The Truly Great. It is written by Stephen Stender. And it goes like this I think continually of those who were truly great, who from the womb remember the soul's history through corridors of light where the hours are suns, endless and singing, whose lovely ambition was that their lips still touched with fire should tell of the spirit clothed from head to foot in song, and who hoarded from the spring branches their desires falling across their bodies like blossoms. What is precious is never to forget the essential delight of the blood drawn from ageless springs, breaking through rocks in worlds before our earth. Never to deny its pleasure in the morning's simple light, nor its grave evening demand for love. Never to allow gradually the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. Near the snow, near the sun, in the highest fields, 
See how these names are fated by the waving grass and by the streamers of white clouds and whispers of the wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life, who wore at their hearts the fire's center. Before the sun, they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. And there, this air today is signed by the honor of the science. This morning when I was thinking of coming to jail, I wanted to get a history because I went on in the internet, you know, because now we can just Google things. And I wasn't finding a very succinct, um, almost biography of uh, uh, Styles. And uh, I had to call somebody that I know that he, he has a passion of trying to collect the history of our theatre. And that person is Sam Martin. Please indulge me when I read this article by Sam Martin that he wrote about the science. And it's, it reads that Pepin Dove didn't act. He became one with his characters. A consummate and brilliant professional. The passion for his craft and the realistic touch with which he conducted himself in front of rolling cameras. And I added this one in the book. On stage <laughs> are evident in every role he has portrayed. Let's just say I didn't write that. <laughs> Audiences could hear his booming, threatening voice and see menacing scorn and the menacing scorn on his face long after the list of credits had dropped down the screen. The old trooper was a rare breed and a natural talent in the business. In the early years of black television, Rastayas, as he was known among those uh, uh, among close associates and colleagues, was already a recipient of a treasure award bestowed upon him for his consummate acting skill. The accolade was the Best Male Actor Award for exceptional performance in a lead role in Kumbula Data in 1982, the first Isikosa television drama series that was launched at the dawn of black television in the early 80s. It is a romantic tale of forbidden love and involves a devoted father who wanted the best for his daughter by arranging a loveless marriage for her with the son of a wealthy business partner. But to her father's disappointment, she only has eyes for a struggling mortal clinic. His next prominent role in the, on the small screen was Mungi Gasu in William Foyer's <coughs> epic historical drama Shabazu in 1986. Movie is king since an Akona prime minister and a resolute figure who, who's prepared to put his life online in defiance of the ambitious and arrogant young prince Ushara Asenzakon Van Makov, famously depicted by the late Henry Clay. In the Shara series, Ndovu's acting talent shines through among a constellation of local and global stars, the likes of Edward Fox. Bingo, Ben Kimbon Jane, Robert Whitehead, Roland Mkwen, Vuisi Yebojana, Simon Mabono Sabella, Sam Williams, Alfred Nogwe, Washington Sikoro, Nomsa Kaba, Daphne Shomuka, and the beautiful Julian Kiza as Queen Nadine. Since this part, Rastaris has largely been typecast in villainous roles, which he seemed to have relished. Perhaps a lesser known but nevertheless colorful bad role is that of Cornelius Hade, the tough and ruthless underworld character in the SABC television series Honeytown in 1994. That was two years after Sarafina, the blockbuster and unseen film based on Bongeni Gemma's market theater and Broadway hit stage production, the same name. In Sarafina, 
He portrayed the role of Mr. Victor Kumel, the irascible history teacher who replaces Mistress Mary Masomuka in Kibobe after he's detained by the security police. Of course, his temperamental character backfires when people turn against him, triggering a riot that invited the ruthless intervention of the police. Years later, he revealed how scared he was when an assortment of missiles from the hands of school children rained on him during the shooting of the classroom scene. The attack was so real, I could feel their anger and defiance of authority, he said. And who can forget his no-nonsense character, Mr. Tim, the school principal in the landmark TV series, Gizo Gizo. Gizo the heartless drug lord and undertaker in Zone 14, the SABC football series was the culmination of these days. Born in November 15, 1938, in Ranfantain in the West End, Patrick and Globe was raised in old Madibunaville, a freehold location whose black and colored inhabitants were forcefully removed under the Group Areas Act and, re and re relocated to Moshake and Dukong's West Township, respectively. In his teenage years, he was a gifted drama destined for greatness in the world of jazz. However, a fortuitous encounter with Gibson Gender, the father of Township Theatre, slightly changed his course. Gender introduced him to stage musicals and he subsequently performed in Sikar, Lifa, and How Long, 19, in 1974. The last being the most famous of Gibson Gender's stage production, the one that got him into this mess. <laughs> Around this time, he also worked with Death and Dawn Lindbergh, folk singers, and the most influential showbiz couple in the world of stage musicals at the time. In 1973, they staged a version of Godspell, originally a 1971 <coughs> off-Broadway musical based on the Book of Man. It premiered in Marseille, Missouri where it enjoyed a successful run for five months. Plays don't even run more than four weeks these days. But when it later opened at Verts, authorities then it on the spurious reason that it was blasphemous. The real reason was that the cast had, multi had a multiracial character. The couple, the couple challenged the banning in the Supreme Court and in a landmark case, the judge ruled in their favor. Poor Apartheid was in trouble as the production opened its doors to audiences of all cultures. Ironically, when Death and Dawn released, and the seagull's name was Nelson, about a boy who rescued an oil soaked bird, they failed to decipher its actual political connotations. Robert, Robert Island prisoner Nelson Mandela and his quest for freedom. Their next production with Patrick and Gilf, the Black Mikado premiered in Deep Hall, Soweto, in 1976. The cast was made of a of the creme de la creme of black performers at the time. They included Ben Sech Masinda, Tandy Klasser, and daughter Lorraine, saxophonist Duke Magas, Harriet Matiwa, singer Sandy Brown, sporting star Koki Two Boots of Alemania. Felicia Marion of Joy Fame, Bruce Mella, and bassist Sipo Kumela of Spirits Rejoice. The Black Mikado went on to play nationwide to critical acclaim before it toured Greece and Israel. One of the most successful shows ever marketed during the dawn of the democracy was The Good Woman of Shakespeare, an adaptation of Battle of Breath, The Good Woman of Sichuan, described as a parable play on urban poverty. Adapted by Tinam Foke and Jenny Susman, who also directed it, it found a new life in a post-apartheid South Africa in a fictional city named Chadville, a dangerous place inherited by various characters. This is, of course, Patrick Ngofu's territory. And in many theatrical work, works, he shared the stage with some of the country's luminaries, like Selaya Romani, Yos Tui, Nam Maggie Williams, Selon Tawu, 
Elster Dube, Pamela Lombete, James Small, and the late Linda Lyman Gutierrez. Other spring rooms included Cry Field in 1987, a drive-away season in 1989. Petrin Tov died of natural causes at his London uh, Ranfontein home. He is survived by his wife and daughter. We couldn't, we couldn't last for more. And thank you so much for putting that together because many of our histories will, will be lost for the next coming generation. Ladies and gentlemen, I ride on the shoulders of giants who were before me. Some of them are in here, some are out of here, some have actually left us. Um, without much ado, I would like to call upon um, Gift GK Dimu to give us a song, not just one, please, just a song, and then um, we'll ask the family representative to be ready, uh, Mr. Gabriel Jabu Musiti, just to be ready as, as they finish, you can come up, and we'll be ready to come up, Jabu uh, Musiti, uh, thank you. There's a meme that I put 
you know, when a man went to, you know, to heaven, uh, God will ask for a, um, you know, when they have to choose whether a man goes to heaven or hell, and God will ask, uh, ask the man if ever he's been married. And if the man is being married, says no, he's been through hell enough. <laughs> 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 uh, in that city, I'm sitting in the person, ladies and gentlemen, if I'm sitting at the end, and why, and the game. And if, 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 My blood family and his love 
just did not have, have ends in a relationship between my sister and him and myself and him. Our two families, the Sitini family and the Ngoru family, became one because of him. Okay. The two families, as I seated here today, are one in spirit and in practice, and have been ever since we got to know each other. Therefore, as I speak on behalf of the family, the Ngobu family today, we appreciate the privilege and the honor of having to share our experience of him with the industry today, from our perspective, from a family perspective. The danger of a single story is a concept famously explored by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in her TED talk. She explained that if we only hear a single story about a person or a group of people, we risk a critical misunderstanding. A single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is that they're not, it's not that they're untrue, but rather that they're incomplete. So you may make decisions and create perceptions that are incomplete. We would like to share a little bit about him today from a family perspective. And we are grateful today for the privilege that you've given us to share another dimension of Ubuti um, that you may not have been aware of. It is not always possible for the public or peers in the industry to know the brother, the father, the husband, all the roles a person plays in his private lives once the cameras have been switched off, the curtains have been drawn, are usually obscured to the public eye. As I say this, I even wonder how great is to try in a short moment to change a perception that people might not know about the individual when they know what they know that they've seen over a period spanning over 40 years in the industry in public life. So, however, allow me to please try and honor his memory by sharing with you those things that really matter to him the most. The things that we believe has impacted immensely the family and our lives, and has shaped how we view life, has shaped how we want to be perceived as individuals, has shaped what we want to achieve in our own individual lives, and excel in our chosen professions. All of us, as a family, are truly grateful it was a part of our family. And was able to influence us in so many ways. Patrick really, truly, and honestly loved his family. There is truly nothing that would have stopped him from providing, protecting, and advancing the interests of his family. I'll give an example. I recently had a story put up about two or three months ago. He didn't know about it that uh, it was such a commotion once at a supermarket when some grown man had pushed his then young little daughter from the counter. As I explained to me when the story was narrated, they literally chased the child bully out of the storm and was prepared to baptize the demon with his bare hands. If one if we're not for the security of the storm anyway. <laughs> That's a love he had for his family. He, he worked tirelessly to provide for his, for his family. Unfortunately, as many luminaries here would know, there are a lot of ups and downs in the industry, and citizens are not the same. In spite of all this, he made sure to do whatever it took to care for his family, immediate family, that's it. Ensuring they had a proper home to call their own. 
ensuring that one day, as they eventually says, okay, there would be no suffering when he was born. He owed mom and not yet for the time she was passing. Often his work took him away from home. There was a time I lived in Cape Town, and more than once he had shoes in the mother city. We would spend lots of hours together. Um, and during those nights, he would never stop talking about his wife and his kid. Um, every now and then, probably every 30 minutes, he would think, oh, I wonder if they came. Do you think I should call them? Or no, let's leave them for later. <laughs> He just constantly, they were constantly in his mind. Beyond that, he loved the broader family. During the holiday seasons, or any time in the year in between, he never missed an opportunity to welcome members of the broader family for a big lunch on a Christmas day, as an example, or a Sunday, a Sunday lunch, for no reason. But everybody in the family knows they were always welcome. At these events, he always talked about the importance of family and how much he loved his family. I can almost hear his voice saying, This is family. Yes. This is family. It's all of you, no one else. You can. It was an amazing thing. I have countless memories to, sh to share, but I'm not going to bore you with them because I think I've made my point of how much you love this family. Um, the generosity that we've all experienced was unparalleled. Over the years, um, he really became the mindset of both families, of the city and the global family. He became the go to person for everybody. As I reflect on his life, it became clear to me all the time that we really lost a leader in this family. Since his passing on Tuesday night, I cannot help but listen to all the stories that are shared by the family members. He inspired us. Every moment with him was an educational experience. It was an opportunity for him to guide and motivate the young man. A neighbor, and also a man I call my brother from in <laughs> Okay. Shared a story recently that his first encounter with her status has never been erased from his memory. At the time, this young man happened to be. Uh, looking at starting at the university and sharing a story of how he's been inspired to go and study at the university. Marcel, the who he was, immediately used the opportunity to encourage him to play it on and make sure that when he's done his study and has moved on with him and has got a career, he will do the same favor to others. Personally, after finishing my matric, I had a desire to study family, but I could not due to finances. So I went and worked at a mine in Sekunde, but he could not rest until the time he saw me take that first flight in my life to travel to Cape Town and further my studies. This just to prove to this just goes to show the inspirational leader he was, leading without the position, leading without the title but just being himself. Ever so often, I had to tell one or another member of the family how intelligent they were, how important they were, how they needed to take their place in society and be proud of their contribution, um, and how proud he was of them every time they shared their successes with me. Those are memories that cannot be forgotten. He loved education. Based on the two stories I've just shared with you, you can already note that as well. During his life, during his life, he and, he and the family faced many challenges. The one thing he did not compromise on 
was ensuring the education of this person. He made sure that she got the best possible education with the resources she had. Beyond that, he fully encouraged her to become the best version of herself. Many years after, you know, my sister, his wife, had enjoyed an illustrious career in the medical industry, who would encourage her to study further as she changed direction and went into management. And he supported all the way while she was doing that atrocious uh, MBA degree. And he was supportive in many ways, more, more than just encouraging her. He made sure when she came home, certain things were already taken care of. And she didn't have to worry about them. When she went to do group studies, he made sure he took care of himself and whatever else needed to be done in the home. His nephews and nieces, is that what they call nieces? I'm not English. Everybody in the family got the best encouragement and support from him. Not only to study, but to go on to become what they were destined to be. So many of us became notable contributors to our chosen professions, hopefully to society at large as well, all the time because we did not want to disappoint them. It is very interesting to me now to note that the encouragement we got from him he applied in his own profession as well. That he was extremely dedicated to his craft. He literally left no page unturned when he was preparing for a shoot. More than memorizing his lines, he always wanted to make sure he understood the context behind the lines. He made sure he wanted to be one with the character he played. That he could stay up all night if he had to, in preparation for the day. Of the week ahead. He would not even leave the study room sometimes on the weekends, and he would just labor at getting the script done. And he would get very frustrated and agitated with himself. It was not getting things right. And when he finally did it, then he said, Many a times I came to visit and he would just come and eat, grab a cup of tea, and he would say, Java, sorry, I gotta go, and he would continue with his work. Sometimes he would even solicit the help of my sister. He would make sure she kept, she, kept, she takes the script while he lays his lines, and she would tell him when he misses the point and so forth and help him until such time he's mastered it to his satisfaction, to his high standards. Um, he was a true professional who personifies to me in the family true commitment and dedication. Years back after the first hearing of his visa and at the height of zone cooking, I visited with a friend. It was a Sunday and we had a Sunday ride with his family. After we left, Driving in the same car, my friend commented, How can such a nice and kind person play such ruthless roles? So convincing. <laughs> and I didn't answer. He answered himself. He said, I guess it's true that you would be better. I fully agree with my friend. But the point I'm making here is that he was truly an honest and kind man. Um, I find it really interesting that my friend, my friend noted that in just one sitting with him. Yeah. As a family of Deva, we felt his kindness in all our lives because there is no trauma or sadness or events in the family that he was not a part of. Always offering help and support. It was truly a relief when he was around because we knew that things would start moving in the right direction. For that, we will truly miss him. He was a disciplined and honest man. Those who happen to know him, I estimate in the last two decades or so, 
may not know that he used to drink and smoke. However, one day he just stopped. Was that easy? Definitely not. I know many of these struggles after this book, this uh, drinking and smoking. However, he looked beyond the pain of salt, the salt discipline, as he considered the pain of regret was far worse than the pain of salt discipline. Years later, he was diagnosed with diabetes. And immediately he changed his diet and stuck to the health diet for the better part of his life up to the end. Many a times I've observed how when they sit around the table and there's very nice food, how he would pick what he knew would support his life. That is an indication to me how he disciplined himself throughout life on major issues of life. He took his insulin uh, test religiously. I've never known a person as disciplined as he was. His honesty was sometimes embarrassing to us as a family. Every week, family and not, we knew exactly where he stood with me. He did not miss his words. He spoke the truth according to God's facts. And that was it. He spoke his mind without fear or favor. It did not matter who he was talking to. He just spoke his mind. Although, of course, however, he remained committed, he remained resolute, he remained hopeful that things would change and improve for the better, not for himself, for everybody and everything he stood. Um, he was also very excited when there was news uh, around legislation that uh, changed and regulated the industry differently. It's a pity this person came prematurely before he saw that that's right, that together it happened. In the last few months, together it happened. In the last few months, his house started really showing deterioration. And consequently, he started adjusting his life to allow him to prioritize his life. This meant also he had to remove himself from public office, and that included himself, uh, him removing himself from the church uh, public office where he was, uh, the final, he was in the finance committee. All because he just realized his health was not going in the direction that. In the middle of May this year, I had the honor of sharing a Sunday lunch with him at his request. I could see that his strength had taken its toll, and sadly, the next day he went uh, for more medical attention and he was admitted to the hospital. Little did we know as a family that he wouldn't come back alive. As already mentioned, he left us on Tuesday evening. So as I told I must say that we are having to do some serious adjustments in the families. <coughs> Transition isn't always comfortable, but it is framed by opportunities and sometimes calamities. We definitely need to look deep within ourselves to find ways through which we can actually learn to live without dignity. He may be gone, but he lives forever in our hearts. As a family, we know that it's not going to be easy, but we are truly grateful for his great contribution in our lives. We hope that, as we will probably hear from his peers and family, that he made a positive contribution to you as well, and a positive we are thankful for the outpouring of everybody's love and support from all of, of walks of life. And this we came to as we seek to find a way to live on without him in our lives. Mr. Seven, I thank you. Thank you.
a person is loved. But when we posted things on social media in the past week, what's been extraordinary is just the outpouring of love from everybody, and even those people in the public, as you said, that didn't know him, can remember the uh, different characters he played, especially from his Elisa and from Zone 14. Although my time spent with Patrick was very short and limited, he left an indel indelible imprint on my heart. On behalf of all of us at MLA, we were proud to represent such a consummate professional and he will sorely be missed by us all. His vast body of work will continue to inspire us and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. Um, I'm going to read a message from Peter Terry, and as I'm reading this message, could um, could you ask Terry? You know, I've said when I started that I lie on the shoulders of giants, and there were those who were before me who paved the path that I am. You know, that I later took on in life. Uh, this is a message from Peter Terry. Peter Terry is an actor, he was the former head of drama at the State Theatre. And he says, It's many years since. Uh, Do you see my glasses? I need to go to that one for now, my apartment is pretty small here. You know, you know when. <laughs> When you are young, you just think you're going to stay young for me. <laughs> and I remember when I started, you know, even now, even now when I sit down, I realize I'm beginning to make the noises my father used to make. <laughs> you know, my father, when he sat down, he would go, <laughs> and he would make even more noise when he stood up. He said, hey! <laughs> but now, um, when I started noticing him, you know, Hey, I said, say, I'm sure I but his problem, but would he be careful as a survivor? So you've never seen Dave inspected at us. And now, when he used to read the newspaper, he would read it like this. He <laughs> <laughs> you know, would go like this. You know, so now that sickness is here now, maybe. Peter Terry writes, it's many years since I worked with Patrick and Joe. But I remember him clearly as a noble human being whose handsome face and unique voice matched his dignity and character. His presence and energy and his work ethic all meant that he never coasted, but always gave off his dynamic best in leading and supporting roles. The State Theatre Drama Company, and I want you to make note of that, the State Theatre Drama Company was a true ensemble, and Patrick was a team player. In football terms, his name would always have been one of the first on the team sheet. I salute you, Patrick, one of the finest actors of your generation. May you be in peace. Thank you, Peter. Patuma, um, uh, could you please come on stage? and give us your ambition. Thank you. 
very much. From the director. To some of the friends I see around here, but most importantly today, to the Njoku family. Thanks for this opportunity to touch up the great theater, television, and film legend, Patrick Styles Ndoku. Talent par excellence. Yeah. And when you spoke about talent, and asked him why in the Gibson Kenta stable we had five of them at a time. He would say to us, come to Didi, the center of talent. And he would coach your Patrick Matebula, your Tam Matebula, your Bobby, your Ace and Zulik, your Pantis and Tony, and he would coach the Len Karanis, the Mutuagis, the Chenanis, and he would continue. And he would say to the right thing, the right thing. I'm in the sea of talent. <laughs> That's the man we are about today. And I want to start by saying, you know, I want to go to the house, and I want to go to the house, and I want to go to the house, and I want to go to the house. It was late in 1974. But he embraced many of us at the DOCC in Orlando East. Darlington Michaels, Juma Mwembe, C. Chuto Masilo, Nom Sanene, Matthew Josh Kaede, Witu Melo Dijue, Susan Teletane, Harriet Peary, and a host of others, including the fresh boy you see on this stage. And <laughs> And we all under the watchful eye of the great Gibson Kente. And the Styles was one of those who mentored us. Since then, we become focused in honor and making sure that our craft grows. We owe it to him and his colleagues of thespians of the time, the Dabam Jongos, the Kenny Majoses, the Simon of Bruno Sabellos, the Mary Twalos, the Pat Mabue, the Sagiti Damini, and a host of icons we look up to for survival in this strange environment, which had us as the young actors then set us up at loggerheads with our parents because we were driven by our passion and the parents were bothered about a sustainable future for their children. And that's where the condition came through. And we'll go back to Boba Stiles and say, Boba Stiles, how did you manage this? I said, I did, the doctor died, but they come back to my mother, and that's this one's one. In the midst of those contradictions, we still saw them all. We become focused in honoring our craft, his sharp voice of reprimanding us still resonates in our ears to this day. We owe him a great deal of gratitude. Truly, we cannot hesitate to repeat and say, La Stiles, bravo. For your guidance, we are perpetually grateful and others gone before you. You are already lining up awaiting your arrival as a celestial devil. They will be applauding you and giving you the deserved standing ovation as you check in. Because even on stage or even outside the stage, if you did something wrong, he would remind you immediately. And he would go say, Brady? Yay, Brady? Come on, come on. And so it was. You have the right to let me. So whether you like it or not, Pasco Magwaza, in how long at the time, had spoken. When I was doing, as the program director said, Saiji Nyagadara, he was doing and portraying so well Pasco Magwaza. And that's the Pasco that many people don't know at the beginning of our problems. 
and we put it on stage. And that's why when you went out to different areas, there are areas where we're not allowed to perform. Areas like Hormon and stuff, areas like Peter Deep, areas like uh, uh, Brute Forest sometimes, areas like Devon, where we removed while performing. And the all people's spirit theater was a white theater at the time. And we were doing things like that time we did theater called protest theater. And that's where you see the ones come from. That's where you the island come from. The night of the long week come from. And many others uh, come from. Survival by Boba Slayer Marelli come from. And many others come from that era. And if that is why sometimes some of us would be wondering what has happened to the people that are in charge today that they would be forgetting. The kind of contribution, your stands in Dorcas, your point in your cameras, your drone of heavens, your, uh, uh, your ten cameras, and many others did to where we are today. All of a sudden, we are this supporting bunch that are packed somewhere with no benefits whatsoever. What a contradiction. Do we forget so quick? It is them. It is them who made contributions into what is called today the Department of Arts and Culture. We wrote white papers, we submitted green papers, and the Moulins of this world were there, the Carol Steinbergs of this world were there, the Nagani Rebellions were there, the Connie Schumers were there. Fortunately, it's Connie's birthday today, wherever she is, happy birthday, as we say, bye bye to last time. All these people were there. And we were making sure that there is a future for the Department of Arts Culture. And today there is a future for the Department, but no future for the office of those policies. My no. contribution. <laughs> and the departure of an arts legend, it might be worth our while to zoom into the creative arts sector and dig deeper to seek to understand for the advantage of any other child from the novels who might want to follow the uncle, who might want to follow the grandpa, who might want to follow the cousin and say, uh, I would want to refer or I would want to do as my uncle did or as grandpa did. Maybe it would be good for us to begin to understand the creative arts sector and dig deeper into it. What type of work? Who is an arts practitioner? How are they meant to survive? What structures are meant to pro be protected to the arts practitioner, the regulatory framework in the arts sector? All the million of corporates operating in our country rely on a number of bodies, institutions, to sustain their operations. In the health sector, you've got your nursing council. In your education sector, you've got your section 27 and many other bodies. They are meant to make sure that that particular sector is driven, the direction that is correct, that will sustain their operations, not in the creative economy. In any work environment, the market board or institute council or government department established for regulating that particular industry goes the right direction, not in the creative economy. It might look glamorous, glittering from afar, but it is zoomed closer. It is very gloomy. And those are the kind of things that we need our young people to be knowing. But yeah, it's not only drama and glitter, there's also gloom. It is the only creative economy that one is aware of, one is aware of that doesn't have a bargaining council, that, have, that doesn't have a system that doesn't have all the kind of benefits that all employer and employer bodies have an operational platform where we engage 
to better the conditions of the working area in which we are. No, those things don't. They're not there. The creatives operate in a very vulnerable sector. There's nothing like an Egypt to one is an Egypt to all here. Here, we must go there. You will see to finish. If all the above don't exist, does it mean the creative art sector will remain permanently temporal? An exploitation of the talent in our country continues unabated. It means the cultural workers' benefit is a dream deferred and one that is bound to us. One is bound to us. Why did the lead of the Styles and Dovers, the boy King of Thomas, decides to write those white papers and green papers to establish the department, to sell which purpose, one may ask. Or where are your attacks? Selling us, alternatively, because we are also taxpayers. We are not exempted from paying tax. I wonder, the, what 25% that we are always charged? At what stage does it go some form of contribution to develop this very place that we are talking about? And we call it all the beautiful names. And we are the only ones, by the way, who have not been declared officially so. Nurses are declared officially so nurses. Educators, educators, plumbers, plumbers, electricians, electricians. We are the only ones who do not have an official name from the Department of Labor. One day you are an actor, one day you are a, pra a, a practitioner, the other day you are an arts practitioner. The you are a communicator, the other day you are a social commentator, the other day you are an artist. You are, don't have an official title. That is universal. And these are the challenges that unfortunately stalwarts like styles and over leave behind. I want therefore to conclude by saying we hope the powers that be in general, but the sports arts and culture department in particular, will be decisive about the future of the South African tax players being the creative arts workers. The quicker some solutions are found, only then shall the arts legends like Rastiris sleep eternally and peacefully, fix the script of those that remain on our stages and platforms. If they wake up to do that, the styles and purpose of this world will truly rest. For now, our styles, it's a wrap. And thank you very much that already your multi-game group is waiting for you to welcome you and show you the new rehearsal room. There is Peter Kit Mofuro waiting for you. There is Sidney Gar waiting for you. There is Victor Sipiwa Mr. Mamulu waiting for you. Hey, I'm all there waiting for you. There's Dwayne Mutambe waiting for you. There's Joe Mabella waiting for you. There's Ken Gampo waiting for you. There's Jenny Majosi. I can come to you tomorrow. The entire class is a great mustache. It's great. It's a great mustache. It's a great mustache. It's a great mustache. It's a great mustache. Uh, just know that all this is live streamed, so it means that the youth, you know what to do with these things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I ride on the shoulders of those who were great. Like it's so even the beginning of the Um you know young people today don't know where we come from. And uh, you know there's 
there are times when I interact with them, and young people today are fearless. They are really fearless. They are not like us. But they don't understand why we are fearful. Let me just break it down a little bit for you, young people. He was talking about the character that was I have called Pastor. Young people today don't know which person is that. But I'll give you a little story. I had an uncle, Obama Nama, the Ashani, and long day low pain in our class, I'm not going to go there. And one day, you know, by the time it was 87, we were traveling, we said, probably I was going to give him something, you know. I think at that time, I'm going to go to the or something, if I'm going to go to the hospital, I'm going to go to So I had to go with him to town to go and, you know, throw him out to us in the years. I think from Lhasa to Kwame, it's almost like two and a half kilometers. And we walked that journey until we got Kwame Inji. And as we get Kwame Inji, Citizen Gale takes in, he goes, Ish, we And 1986, PW Porter has abolished the arrest of passports. You know, we throw them in the In the land, it's a boche. But you know, it was not good. A geomart. He traveled back to go get the passport. And he just realized how mentally, psychologically, we are part of this and they. During apartheid, as a black person, you never knew when you were right or wrong. You were always born as us, or to work. Maupi saw you, he points up or he boom. You're already on the end of the road. Oh my God, You know what I mean? And how that has affected the psyche of black people and stones. But yeah, you know, as you young people become fearless, but maybe we need to actually say, have you guys sit down, let's have a sit down and share these stories so that you understand why Abbas and Bailey. You know, sometimes young people think they're not being affected by apartheid. You know what I mean? You know what? You have slept and woke up with a fact of you. Let me not preach. And uh, get on air. Uh, can you use the, the video ready? Is it so, 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 so? Are you ready to press? Ah, uh, press up. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? The year is only beginning, and already the school looks like a ghetto. I trust that we have not forgotten the three golden rules of Super Safe. Smart dress, smart dress, cleanliness, and discipline. Go out there and drum it into the new students. They must learn to obey without thinking. Habit must win over their minds. I want this school scrubbed from top to bottom. And as for those old students, I want you to remind me that they are back with it so much. I thought the problem is from Tasmania on my land. Miss Bell, 
Mais ici, ils ont des professeurs. You said the textbooks will be delivered this morning. When will they be delivered? I hope I don't have to phone you again. You want to see me sometime? Miss Ben, I've met many young teachers like yourself coming straight from the university. You know, I guess they want to change everything. No, sir, not really. Don't worry. I know how it is when you're still at university. But you're going to have to learn that the real world is different. I Sir, I'd appreciate it if I could see a copy of Spencer's code of conduct. Remember, Mr. Tell, you're the temporary teacher here. We don't step on too many toes. Especially mine. <laughs>
carry for sale. Mm-hmm. It's expensive. Why are you not really pissed in the world? They want to do it. That's not what you told anyone to buy. But you think you can go to the shop. Carry for sale. Sledge. Go back to the shop and say, okay, okay. Why is it more than that? You go to the shop. Sai, boy, and Rata. 
Mohammed or a Rata, we will be calling Rata. And Bo Robert Magwaz and the photographer. They were doing a play and I got involved in the play and I started as an amateur in 1975, late 1975. First performance was in January in Nadine Hall. Now, her start out act that normally in Oklahoma on stage you could sometimes the stage bounce. Yeah. Yes, mama. No! Let me get shot so. That's where I started. This is where I want to go to. I'm going to politic a little bit. Now, when I was 15, now I was born in 1960. Ogris Karim was born in 1970. Uh, so when I started, in 1975, Yes, I will. He was five years old. James was born in 1969. So let's start with that. He was six years old. In 1981, when I debuted to look at him, I was 21. Aubrey was 11 years old. James was 12 years old. And I'm just saying to you, there is a history. And there is uh, there is something very wrong. Are you there, Patrick? Is he there? Patrick Woody? What? No, I was asking again. Who got that? Patrick Woody? I didn't sound cool, did he? <laughs> you know when you were starting when I was 87, the bomb don't worry, 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 the bomb don't I used to be with Penny Chatteris, you know, the, when I got a call from Penny Chatteris that there is an audition, then maybe I would dress in a suit, you know, you know, go to an audition. And uh, as you walk out the street, more and you start to laugh at who's a woman on the solution, and ow, you're not. Was ready to go home. One of my friends, father, we are who was that? Well, man, how was your father? Who's still in law? Who's still in the 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 it's a I would like to call upon Carol and Mbomolepo uh, to come to the stage and share their memories of Brasiles. Are you there, Carol? Are you there, Mo? What's that, Carol? What's that? It's one of us. 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 Tim, this man, like, 
is very rough. <laughs> so I was very serious. So I was scared of him. You know? Until I get to work with him. First time Shana and I was in zone 14. She had the mean van I was under my jokes. <laughs> Um, so I remember one day uh, we were supposed to do a scene, uh, like six scenes back to back, me and I, uh, one on one, and I was so scared. I made sure that day that I prepare. I made sure that I read my script, I write my notes and everything, like everything was in point. And I made sure on that day I was laughing because you know he will give you that look. <laughs> and then, <laughs> because he didn't want you to waste your time. It, it, like he was so professional in a way, Buti, like do your lines, read your lines. Because I knew Buti, like he always like on point with his lines. So I made sure with that I don't laugh from that day. So after those scenes, and then he came to me, and I was still nervous, and he said to me, <coughs> I was like, Babu, no, like, <laughs> and then, and I was like, I was so relieved. Actually, he had reminded me of my granddad. Like, he had, like, our similarities, Adam Kunwam. Uh, he was very stylish. He was very, very clean. He would my jokes. <laughs> And my granddad began to and he loved his his craft, he respected his craft. He was always on point. Like he didn't want to hear anything when it comes to his craft. He was very, very disciplined. Um so I mean he left a void, a huge void in the entertainment industry. We learned a lot from him and we we'll always miss him. And I'd like to say to his family, his friends, colleagues, Nati Uguti, Sila Shegele, and Alisham Nashe Ungelshan, rest in peace. With that day, Patrick, Udo, Ola Nemotolo, Gabundu. Thank you. The following week, first day on set, 
Guess what? He's paying my grandfather. <laughs> Hortense, 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 Hortense. So he started by saying, Jay, take it to small touch. I see you smile, I don't know. As long as everyone I'm gonna sell one, we can have a whole shop. From that day, he became my friend. We shared so many scenes together, Ali and I. Um, there was this mortuary in Spanish school called o Orlando Sopera. So it was not available uh, during the week. So we could only shoot there on weekends. We knew it would come Sunday or Saturday. That's our day. All she tickets got money and affair. And the scenes are that before we get on set, we workshop them. And he made sure by the time you're on set, we know exactly what we're doing. We didn't even feel the pressure of the day with so many scenes because we knew exactly what we were doing. And then I had to leave Zone 14 at some point. And he was not happy with me at all. I remember I'm phoning him. Um, and the phone reception was bad. In the go, we were still shooting. We were shooting Red City for ETV for Hyde Park. So he says to me, Is there a landline more than one? Okay, okay, fine. I gave you the number that I'm officing. I go to the office, I take a call, I get a problem with it, and then first thing is that he says, Mo, you better leave that show now! You better leave that show! <laughs> I can't even answer back because I'm sitting here with the producers. <laughs> and it was not even helping that meeting the likes of Angus Gibson in the streets. They would say to me, Ah, oh, you traitor. <laughs> And I really felt like a traitor because thank you. Thank you so much. He gave me a call one day. He got in the roof. He was not happy with Petri Mufu. What's Petri Mufu? <laughs> yes. I don't know what happened. I said, I had already left the show. And then he called me and he said, Hey, come speak to your friend. Come speak to your friend. Pick the room and say, I know, I need you to come on set. Then I drove to set. When I got there, he told me that he had an active day. And then we all know as actors, when he, it's not your day every day. There will be a day where it's not yours at all. So he had too many lines and he couldn't crack them. And then I think, I thought I'd be thinking, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, And then he was not able to do that. I don't get him out of all people. He was laughing. <laughs> out of all people. <laughs> then I said to Bentley, we are broke. We better go and apologize. <laughs> and then Bentley went and apologized. And then he phoned me and said, Yo, Tia, what was this? We're fine. We're fine. Then I said to Bentley, we are and that and I was just kept communicating. Even if it was up, even this year. I was checking my last messages for me, maybe end of April this year. <laughs> but the one thing that he kept on complaining about, and this is my plea to the industry, theater houses, production houses, please include our parents in your stories. But Pam was not working for a long time. I know I just had Mila saying uh, he did something this year, or was it last year, I don't know, but he complained about work for the longest of time. Please include our parents. I know I've got a parent in the industry, my dad is also an actor, and I can see what it does to him. Please include our parents. It's not like they retire, it's you, the industry, that retires them. Yeah. They still want to act. So it's a good But it's so true, man. It is so, so, so true. 
If I was not producing the plays that I've acted in after 2010, I wouldn't have been on stage. 2017 was the last time I was on stage in the theatre. And, and up until this year, when I'm doing that in order to uh, do ever uh, in theatre on this way. And our kids, I have to produce it myself. That's why I'm saying there is something going that is very wrong going on in the industry. And yes, we are being retired before we can even retire. I don't know, are people hang their boots, uh, they hang their gloves. What do we hang? <laughs> we have we our intellects. That's what we do, you know. And I meet with a lot of young actors who just graduated and have chats with them. And, you know, we talk about things, we talk about acting. And one thing that I, you know, I, one thing that I love in the industry, you know, because as actors we do it. I mean, we hope that we can, you know, when I get into character, you know, you know when I get into character, and you, you think, you, you think, oh, hey, what do these people do? So how do you get into character? No, 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 and to all the matter, I think that is the biggest BS that we say about getting to character. I think what we want to say is that because character is defined by actions. Character is, I mean, writers do whatever write. They will write, for oh, this character does this and this. You know what I mean? It's defined by that. What we want to say is that we are focusing so completely or intently onto the series of actions that we've got to perform that we forget everything else. It is just nothing but concentration. And people concentrate in all aspects of life. You know, a pilot when he's flying, he's, he's concentrating. A driver when he's driving, he's concentrating. You know what I mean? So you got to say you try to what it takes. So if I guess, but how do you get into character more time? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the, that's the beauty of life. Hey, uh, <laughs> There's only one clue on this and I got so I like you for starting. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise it gives you like a cool. <laughs> Ceremonies, the family um, that I have spoken much about with Patrick, and unfortunately, never really got to know you. But I can tell you, I can confirm how important you were to him, to friends, to colleagues. Um, so, Paul called me and he asked if I could put together some scenes. Um, and I, uh, I had a whole lot to do today. Um, so I went to people that are working with me and I said, look, we, we need to put together some scenes for, for Patrick's memorial. And um, I dipped in and out. And it just reminded me, I just, each time I saw him, I just thought, ah, oh, he was so fantastic. He yeah, was a star. Um, he was a, he could drive a show, like his enigma could, people could go along with that enigma. Um, okay, so I want to, talk about that later, but let me go back to the beginning. I didn't really know him. I was aware that he, at the time, had been um, playing this very sort of uh, warm father kind of figure on a children's television show. And we 
casting easily so. And um, so both my classes said to me, in so many, I mean, uh, the principal is definitely Patrick and Bill. So it was thanks to Zabok and his knowledge of Patrick. So I have no memory of an audition, and perhaps we didn't audition. But um, the first day on set, in fact, it was the speech that you saw a bit of there where he speaks to uh, the teachers in the staff room. And um, he was quite tense, um, quite scary. Um, and um, we had already sort of been shooting for a little bit. And we had already developed a style of big improvisation. So, you know, you would use the script as a springboard for a whole lot of other things. This did not suit Patrick. He didn't like this idea at all. Um, he was a person, he was a professional. He learned his lines. And I think he worked, he had sort of certainly worked, he knew, worked very hard the night before learning those lines, and he wanted to deliver those lines. And he wanted the actors opposite him to deliver the lines they were supposed to deliver with him, not, not, not anything else. So anyway, he, he did the first take. I thought, okay, he's interesting. And then I said to him, just be absolutely still. Don't forget any gesture or anything. Because your face is so incredible, your voice is so incredible, you have to do very little. And then he delivered the speech. And we all, he was their principal. And it's not for nothing that he is the first figure that you see in the first season of Easy Easy. Because his enigma drove that show. And the actors, I mean, the, the writers loved him so in the role that um, one of our, one of the writers, and she's a much older, would constantly try and write him back into the show, but there was a, a whole agenda, and we couldn't have a fascist principle returning. So, um, unfortunately, Patrick, when he left Diesel, was gone from that world, and we missed him. So when Zone 14 happened, we knew who our antagonist was going to be. It was, we were thrilled to be able to call Patrick back. And he, he there was the, he was the heart of the enigma of that show, his beautiful suits, Listen to that jazz and that beautiful funeral part with this kind of hangers on, giving stage a hard time. He was the driver of that show. And he was scary. <laughs> um, for anybody, I mean, Carol attests to it. Anybody that didn't know their lines was suitably scared of that. Um, and there were many people that arrived on set without knowing their had lines. And he would, he would let it be known. He was a straight talker, as the family attests. He also was quite sort of hard on directors. If he didn't like a director, he would let that director know as well. Um, <laughs> I have had directors in tears trying to deal with that. Um, anyway, he loved Paul. Um, and Paul kind of did all the things he wanted an actor to do. And he loved the scenes that he shared with Paul. 
in fact, the reason that Mpo left was because constantly, in fact, SABC was a useless partner on Zone 14. They would start and then they wouldn't continue the contract. And in fact, then Rhythm City started up and they kind of cherry picked a number of our actors. And I said to them, I said to the actors, look, he looks like a solid proposition. They're going to pay you better. Go. And so we lost him for. And I, we all regretted the people that we lost to Rhythm City. But I wish them well on that show. And it's lasted forever. Um, so it was a good move in many ways. But anyway, when Mpo left, I had met this young actor in, in uh, Alex called Bongani Maseko, got up. And I said, don't worry about it. We've got a fantastic person to replace Digger. So I brought on Bongani, and Patrick was not convinced. <laughs> he gave Sledge quite a hard time. Um, and so I think uh, Bulgarian is a smart guy, and I think that he understood where he had to be, and he, he sort of asked Patrick to be his mentor, which Patrick kind of became. And then a warm, solid relationship developed. And that fabulous duo of Molloy and Sledge graced our screens. Until such time as the SABC and its wisdom closed the show down. Which was a tragedy to me because it was such a it was such a great vehicle for so many actors. And it was great for Orlando West. No, for Land East. You know, people in the community worked on it. Um, it had an incredibly good spirit. And Patrick was at the heart of all of that. And he was a star. And the show closed down, and I went on to do Spire, in which there wasn't a role for, for Patrick. And inexplicably, he did not immediately go on to do more work. I mean, he was like, he was, a, he was an extraordinary actor. And I, I could not get it that he didn't immediately just go on to something else. And that was incredibly hard for Patrick. One, because as a family person, as a patriarch, he wanted to be able to solidly support his family. And we often spoke about that. And as an actor, he wants to be acting. Um, and you know, I offered him, I, I gave him roles in, or he gave roles in, in Rhodes and Niso. But they were, they were small roles. They were not roles that, that suitably challenged him. And my dream really was, I would constantly say to the writers, come on, let's make a show in which we can put Patrick at the heart of it again. And alas, that hasn't happened. I have to say though, I was so happy to see him shine in Knuckle City. He was so fabulous once again on that film. And I think he got a suffer for it. Is it right? So well deserved stuff, and he should have had many, many awards. I don't know, perhaps he did. But I I do, I mean passion was a case in point. I mean I know many actors that are incredibly talented, but I think, damn, they just don't get the opportunity. Um, and I'm really sorry that he didn't have a last great role. Perhaps 
perhaps as a, a warm father, perhaps as a teacher, whatever. And I mean, I'm sure, I may have been bad guys, but I'm sure he could play anything. So, thank you to the family for him. He was a gift. Thank you all. Thank you.
Kutoma uh, Sisi wa mubi Ujelevi Mwambi Agasa kui uh, Hashem Kuya luza Gift of Mtajiri Bad Mtajiri Bad And then why they're coming on uh, Shane does a corner. Okay, that was right. And Shane will come with his, with his tribute. They are laying the carpet for you with song. <laughs>
why I say so, it's simply because you have brastides, you have bravita, mesomacum, popularly known as brasinti, you have bracanmen, pine, and by extension, I'm coming, I'm coming. So, by extension, you had his sister. He envied the talent Yabogosaki, and he privately wished that he could be a product of the <laughs> To an extent that he decided to go get married to Yabogosaki. <laughs> so bad, <laughs> you can be associated with this place. So, if you go to, if you go deeper into that how long crew, indeed you had Rakit Mufolo on the trumpet, you had the likes of Sidney Kai on the saxophone with, with Tamako on the piano. So so then there he goes. He's proving me right. He's proving me right. There he goes. So greatness. Yaprostites is not isolated. It's within a collective. It's a collective leaders, Yamasaki. And no doubt that if we were in the football arena, Prostites will be likened to the great Bede. Or if we're in the boxing field, he'll probably be equivalent to the great Mahoma Ali. If it was basketball that we are talking about, his terrain of talent was exercised in the field of basketball. There is no doubt that he would be likened to the greats that came in the sport, such as Michael Jordan. Such was the greatness of the man that continued to roar more and more, that continued to become more and more alive with each and every acting cast that he got. His star continues to shine with each production. And as I just said, every production he was in, his star continued to shine. His light continued to shine. Therefore, the entertainment or the arts industry, I'm not sure which one is suitable. If practiced correctly and responsibly, it becomes the most important tool. It becomes the most powerful tool in a human life. Because practitioners in this space, I liken them to people like Baruch. I liken them to psychologists. I liken them to a prophet Alina Kazasejo. Why I'm saying that, and remember earlier I, I qualified the statement, I said the industry, if practiced and utilized correctly and responsibly, it becomes the most powerful tool in human life. Hence, I liken it with some of the personalities that are regarded as powerful and important in society. Because through your acting, through your singing, through your performances, you soothe people's souls. You influence people's lives. Therefore, no doubt that through his talent, his gift, his skill, Rastayans, touched many a soul. Because if millions of people can leave what they are doing to sit down and watch you perform, to sit down and watch you exercise what is God given in you, then you know that we didn't just come to add numbers, 
Jesus one. We came to see and we came to conquer. Indeed, because Christ was an achiever, he was a conqueror. He was extraordinary in more ways than one. That we only see in the longevity in his acting. As I end, I wanna MC, I mean the Mr. MC. Yeah, I'm a town. Yeah, when I see uh it's always another disadvantage of it is the one who did it today. I could have been long cut. <laughs> Let me just conclude by reading what I hope on my broadcast platform on Saturday. And on this one you are so wrong. I'm the one to make that there's no platform. <laughs> if they wait before I enter the match. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Brass, Tysonov was a real man boy, an actor of excellence, a first period extraordinary. Talent is innate in all of us. We are gifted in one form or the other. However, what catapults people to unassuming iconic and legend legendary stages is their ability not only to hold, but to also sustain and grow their talents, gift, and skills. For as much as it is humanly possible, in order for them to be able to continuously keep their relevance, longevity in their shows and films. This, this is what sets apart iconic and legendary individuals like Rostides from the rest. It is this unique and uncanny neck that sets apart the extraordinary, like Rostides, from the ordinary. Rostides took to acting as a fish would take to water. He dazzled viewers and fellow actors alike with his acting skills, talent, and gifts with so much ease and effortlessness. Watching him act, you would swear that acting was intrinsic to his DNA and blood vessels. The subtle natural swag and nonchalance in his acting was the stuff you would only find in the special ones, the chosen ones. And it is indisputable that Rastais was indeed the special one. He was definitely the chosen one. There is no doubt that Rastais was a real McCoy, an actor by accidents, a first year extraordinaire, and a true theater, television, and film impresario, whose death in acting talent effortlessly, effortlessly transcended these acting platforms. Rastas was a multi-award winning actor whose profile in the industry lived like a galaxy of stars. And with him as the gravitational force that holds these stars together. In a career spanning for over four decades, Rastas featured in various high-profile viewership chart, topping an award-winning theater, television, and film productions, both as an actor and a director, proving his versatility and method as a rare talent. Humility personified, I guess, we've heard that over and over again. Not the one to let his missing achievements in the South African acting industry go to his head. Those who cross professional paths with him in his long-standing career simply describe him as a consummate professional, a feat not usually associated with people of such gigantic status like, like that of Palestine. Society has witnessed how individuals who have achieved just a fraction of Palestine's, just a fraction of Palestine's Economies usually go big heads, start working on imaginary springs, and behave as if they have arrived. 
on the contrary, he was on the contrary, Rastas was humility personified. He was very well grounded. He was a real epitome of human excellence. We can all learn a thing or two from his clear seeking of professional life. If I had to character, characterize Brastels in one sentence, I would simply write, Brastels was simply the best. No one can dispute that the man was a rare gem. This is not surprising at all. Simply because Brastel's enemy out Yakasi gave us the Audi Fan Mushake, Mushake in my hometown. It's a home to real trailblazers, groundbreakers, winners and champions across various societal fraternities, which has produced Towering figures of equivalent like of equivalent iconic and legendary characters like that of Palestine's. And this is what made Palestine's name to be reckoned with. This is what made him a national treasure. I know from time to time our society has been initiated with a bizarre teaching that when someone dies, then we must proclaim that their soul must rest in peace. However, please allow me to take an unorthodox posture and proclaim that instead of resting in peace, May the soul of Rastiles continue to vibrate in love, peace, and joy. May I proclaim that he transcends to become Ito's Elise. Oni Okachene. Ito Zilo Kutuna. Ito Zilo Kumeleto. Ito Zilo Letano. Ito Zilo Letano. Thank you very much. You. you see how gracious I am. But you know, like uh, when we're talking about the creative industry and all that, and here's something as well. What I love, I love, what I love about our government, it comes with these beautiful things. Creating. Industry, you know. So, which means we fall within industries. <laughs> yeah, manufacturing industries, mining industry. You know, not here for beautiful things. Then they start looking for black industrialists. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but they don't look for black industrialists in the creative industry. So now we are talking industrialists. And then what is an industrialist again? Go into the dictionary. You know? An industrialist, whether you think of an example who does manufacturing, you know, or mining bar and all those things, isn't it? That's what you think, man. That's an industrialist. But an industrialist is somebody who manages an industry. That's the dictionary you need to know for it. So my last time I mean, when I was babysitting music, and I was a machine you told me I can use a key and all that. But here's the thing, guys. You know when our country when I, you know my father when Mandela was released, he cried. And in his tears or in his crying, basically it was almost a relief. You know what I mean? Today you will cry a different tear. You know? And but here's what is happening. 
Professor Law, who is now born in the Philippines, I can't go and work. I will have a challenge. I will have a challenge. Because I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. Now they will. I want to And this is what we have been reduced to. That we have become so territorial. So, but our posting for us, you know, we must really show a racial level. You know what I mean? Because it has grown to be very, very, very destructive. Because now they, we can't even cross pollinate amongst ourselves. But Braki does cross pollinate. <laughs> Two way. Two way. Two way. Two way. Two way. No, no, it's not like the desperation. It's not the desperation. No, 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 no. There was metal. Now you go on okay, that ain't it for her. Okay, you remember that when we come to the end of the day. Um, if I said something that you believe, it reminded me of two, I mean, two things that you said, you spoke about. You said, you said acting, you know, some of them need to be very... I never say it as an act, but I've read very well. You know, and there's a book here, and uh, I think kudos to Brad Dixon uh, because he made me a word that called Six Lessons for Eighty by Richard Polanski. And in his introduction, Richard Polanski says, acting like Christian is a calling. That is, you know. And here's another thing, and you spoke so, you know, eloquently about for a, you know, people stop whatever they're doing and come to watch us and all that. And it is a very privileged position in that sense. And I remember, but this I read, I think maybe, I think it was an autobiography of to me. And as someone there said, that in theater is like the dogmat of society. The society comes to the theater to dust off the dust, but to shake off the dust that they have gathered through the day. And from it, they get rejuvenated and all that. And through them, about just yesterday, oh my Lord, we were together, and he, he said something that Dieter read the river. You know that they have the German director, there was a German director who was the head. And he said, Dieter, in his German accent, said, it was a theater, it's black. The artistic director of that place must be shot down. And at the present moment, we live with so many theaters that are black, are dark, and they don't have the audiences. There are Hey, we've got stuff to sort out. We really have got stuff to sort out. But they think they have followed each other. So, I'm going to look at starting this one. Before, on this out gift, and then I went to one of me. I went to take it to me and I'm going Before, on this out gift, I would like to ask oh, oh Patrick. Uh, you have a name called Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know Patrick Shai, my guy, don't know what. But Patrick in city, yeah, my dear, in city, please come and give us the vote of thanks. Names are the Thank you. 
Deutsche Benefiz. Ja, meine Liebe. Ja. Ich hoffe, Family, ähm, der Rest der Familie ist das ein Richter Ziel. Communities, in Jesu und Krümmen, da gehen wir auch zwei Communities von Maran, Südafrika. The definition of a person of Africa should be also an African. Siamo mea cool. It has been a very difficult time for us as family to lose Oprah's eyes. Yes, uh, a lot of things have been said, but there's a lot more that hasn't been said. We thank each and every one of you for coming out here to spend your valuable time. Now, if I were to say something about thanking you for your valuable time, you in the entertainment industry, whatever they call it, you are the people that know that time is money. Mom Shady La, there's money that you could be making that you're not making because you sacrifice those three hours of your entire life to come and be with us here. Siabonga Kakulu, Siabonga, Siabonga. We don't wish for anybody to leave us. We don't wish for anybody to die. But in the event that it happens to somebody else again, we hope to see the same support. Somebody said something about the number of people. This is expected. We are all human and we're behaving like human. Program director said, Silo Matigaritum. Uh, I have just been requested or reminded to indicate that the funeral of our brother, Uka Styles, is going to be on Wednesday. It's going to start at the Methodist Church in <laughs> <laughs> And then obviously it will go accordingly and we'll try to keep to as uh, strict a time as possible so that whoever comes to support us does not end up wasting that time of their lives. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Eva. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come almost to the end of the day. Yeah? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Yes. Eight o'clock. Yes. Yes. And then now that is one on set for our book. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Um, in the mind of thanking uh, the five expensive ways and expensive ways, and, you know, in my way. Baby girl, do it to her. You know, Sweet Honey on the Rock is an American group called Sweet Honey on the Rock. There's a lovely song called Breath. Breath, if you have time, when I, you know, you can pull it, pull it to me. Listen to that song. There's a beautiful line out of it and that says, Those who have died have never ever left. The dead have That, that act. You know, sometimes, you know, when you think of each if you are here, you'll be saying this. The voices of our parents never leave our heads. Even when you are down, you would know already. My mother or my father would say this. And by just remembering that, that's a pact that hit. They do with us because they stay in our minds. In closing, I know, you know, I mentioned names and I would be thought I'm a coward, I'm not a coward. The names that I've mentioned, if they want to be, I said it a little tete-a-tete, -tete, I'm ready. I didn't mention them because I'm trying to attack them and then drink another. I think there are things that need to be said. 
you know, and because and with my generation, that's what we say them. You know, the other coming generation we will say them, but not Helen Brown. And I didn't mention the age because him being born like an elder, I've actually respected them. Both of them have directed me, even though I've mentioned their age. So I am using like an elder, but there's something very wrong that is happening, and we need to sit down and get it right. You know. That's a small way, you know, the end of it. That's the way it's a small way. Hey, I've got a young wife. <laughs> I've got a young wife. And who are you to choose? 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 And all because of my young wife. Baby, baby, you can tell me more. There's my wife, and I'm more than social media. <laughs> That's my wife. That is why I'm not sure what to do. Since I'm trying to create this to me, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? But let me close, ladies and gentlemen, by saying, I can't even bother with you. Let me close by, I think there's a poem that I wrote for Nike Everybody. Nike Everybody used to run a modeling agency. And they said, I'll have a one and the color star group here. And don't give him less than the only one. So, but I'm a man, I'm a man. But I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a man, just at the end of it all. I don't know why I'm a teacher. Just to thank you. You know, I wrote a poem for Nike Gribari. And Nike Gribari used to run a modeling agency called Siazaz. You know, and on its first day anniversary, you know, I went there you know, to watch, you know, to be part of the celebration. Actually, I'm older, I'm still doing that. 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 Once proud beings then reduced to a corrosive humility, our souls disgracefully packed and sown. Times tick, turn the meek to bone, elevating our spirit to a height much to perplex our as might. Cause now, Siazazi, we know who we are. Sing, get a little sweet. 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 Sing, get a little sweet.